knew there was something wrong. The day he came home from Concrete, showed me the layout, said, look at this, our future. What a stinking shitbag, I said. You call that a future? He was showing me plans and drawings of a farm he wanted to build in the country where the children and I could stay away from the shit in the city. I said I belong in the city. I left all that. I walked out. I ran out with the gun. That's my family, I said. You know what this shitbag does? He writes an open letter in his bourgeois left paper admonishing me, telling his audience Ulrika will come back. She's one of the stray children of the new Germany, he said. Lucky for him, I did not try and use him for target practice. That in itself would not have been a bad idea. It is they who have dragged us down. Dragged us down with their stupid morality of denial. They have made our screens lonely. I am not dressed in hope. Merely the knowledge that the morality I strive for is the only one left. He lives comfortably now. He found a woman and a home in the country. He found his holy family. I found mine. The first robbery was like the first fuck. I knew there would be no glory in my world, even though my comrade Andreas, my lover Andreas, hoped there would be. But when you watch those you love either shrink or explode, glamour becomes something only an artist like Andy Warhol can understand. The rapid movement of cowardice. I wrote that on a wall outside an artist's collective. Gundred was in the car laughing, but more quickly than the car could move, she began to cry. You know, we knew there were only two ways to go. Neither had anything to do with hope. And we knew ours may be the only home of vision, but we were never pious. That is the house where the bullshit left live. There they construct a tyranny of lies to keep their grotesque sense of glory alive while murdering those who have taken the words of the only prophet seriously. It's knowing that the state is not omniscient. It has lost its sense of control. It has lost grip of what it is. I know that a monster that is dying is more dangerous than one that is strong. But you know, they are so lost. They are the stray children of the new Germany. After the first robbery, Andreas and I arrived at the safe house. We count the money. He wants a Porsche, a better getaway car, he says. I want better guns. We have a fight and I hit him. I was always more physical than Andreas. We found local hoods and they sold us the worst pieces of shit. Jesus, we were not exactly naive, but we were unused to the demands we would have to make. We learned quickly. Later, there was no quarrel about our weaponry. We arrived at the best and we knew what to do with them. They were not ornaments like ideology is for the left. These fucking shits. These fucking murderers. And they called us murderers. They said, you would bring down the state on us. And for years, the state has not only been coming down on us, it's been kicking us in the teeth. When they attacked us, I could see how clearly these fuckers needed faith. Like men once needed gods, they want faith. Not to transcend this stinking fucking shithole, but they need a faith to keep a life not worth living, livable. I knew there was no faith left. These people want to wait for the working class. They keep still with their myths. They wait forever. But when any element of the move start dancing towards change, they kick them in the teeth. Say, no, this change will be dangerous for us. This change will hurt us. Meanwhile, these apes hold hard onto their party badges and their stupid party lives. Even the young, these kindergarten followers of Mao. How easy some people let themselves be betrayed. The party does not even need to develop good lies. A few dressed up ones from the 30s will do. They need the lies. This place has burned them in less than a decade and we can no longer talk about history. No, another demonstration, another strike. That will keep them and their rich happy. 
They call us murderers. We are not. We are assassins. When we kill the rich, they change their lives. They have to live another way. They don't go out alone anymore. They become more honest about their friends, the mafia, the thugs they always bring out when time demands. And anyone who believes these stormtroopers were asleep is a fool. One hit on the skull teaches you more about the state than 20 paperbacks. The rich's life will never be safe now. We are everywhere and every one of us they murder, another 10 of us will move. We have a story about Martin Schleyer. This mass murderer turned labour expert was going to Australia to teach their rich about industrial democracy. Well, we plucked Schleyer out and we left him in the back of the boot of a car. We wanted to show Australian workers how to teach their rich. That's an interesting dialectic, even for Marx. We changed the sense of politics in our time. The gun has a much finer sense of polemics than the Queen ideology has. When we move, the rich stand still, because it is those that fight in the streets where our fight may never show victory that I sing. Songs of destruction of all the shit created in capitalism's defecation. And it will not stop until we move with rage and compassion, expose our victories and show them this dance. I moved in here with my family. I wanted to destroy, to destroy, to destroy the buildings where my lovers shrink, to destroy the streets where my lovers fell, to destroy the earth built to drain my lovers' arms, to destroy constructions where my lovers explode. I needed to build an earth to strengthen my lovers' arms, to be an honest voice. I can remember being asked by an old immigrant worker she asked me, pointing to the sky, do you wear underpants, for I fear the world does not. She said that the sky was bursting, and I knew it was. And that even if we failed, we had to show the enemy that we could not be controlled so easily. To be turned against ourselves. Once everyone claimed we should fight together, but when it came to the real darkness, they all pissed off. They went running to their drugs, to their Indian holy men, to their banal dogmas, to escape this darkness that could be wiped away with a single strong fist. <coughs> My husband, a pretender, he starts this magazine so all those of the left persuasion could write their analysis. And they have just kept on writing their analysis. Like good Jews, they will keep writing their analysis as they march towards the wash house, as they enter the skies of bursting flame. Like sloppy painters, their language will become more obscure and their behavior more pious. Their friends, all those that live with this monster in the new Germany have developed such delicate ways of surviving with it. They film their alienation to win awards at the palaces of the dying culture of the bourgeoisie and yell plaintively, let me in, let me in. And our poets who once had tongues make out they're either in East Germany or Tibet and they ask us to listen. While I am cleaning this gun, I have been looking at you as indeed I know you never look at yourselves. And I ask myself, could there ever be a Gundred Eslin out there? And there's no hope, there's no comfort in knowing your place. But I want to go on. You may more clearly see yourselves. We had to start our organisation with all sorts of shits saying they knew where they were going. No one knows where we are going. No fucking one knows. And then we pulled out the gun, how suddenly their vision disappeared, how quickly it became a plea for understanding. We, we don't want to be understood. We don't want analysis, we want fear. We know what brings about change. We know what brings about your dumb silence. 
There were amongst us many I loved, many I cared for. They said, we want the new world. But they kept on collapsing, they kept on falling over, and I could not bring them back, I could not lift them up and say, here we go then, up again. Some of you just want to sleep, but listen, sometimes the end of the world happens in the cold silence of night. Look, I'm not here as a teacher. They all left when the ice of our century made itself perfectly clear. Nor am I an icon that you can keep quietly away. Then we started, it was clear where the rest of you had gone. Your lives would be spent on developing the most discreet forms of survival. You could call hope and dress it up as chance. And your holy men was so very easy to see. Just clumsy men, aberrant forms of an alienated bourgeoisie. What they had to tell you, you already knew. You knew how easily we imprisoned self in the most clumsy apparatus and let it deceive, make justification for our bad dreams. Then you called that wonder and you asked your holy men to let you see, oh Christ in heaven. It used to make Ingrid laugh. You see, her whole orthodox left family joined in a voyage with some mystic and found only what their previous master had left out. But it gave them an excuse to suggest they were free. But Ingrid was the first of us to learn the power of the gun, to learn how she could become entirely free. We knew we could never come back, nor wanted to become tortured elements of scared people making out they were clean. I can remember waiting for my first hit. A judge who not only served in the SS as a butcher in Poland, but ever since had drawn up laws to make even those tortured children less free. Laws that stopped anyone who had flirted with a pamphlet of Lenin, carried red flags on May Day from getting any security. I waited for him to come home from an evening sexual license, knocked on his door and asked if he could see me. I wanted to ask him, to tell him, but time for analysis of faulty memory was gone. I can remember pumping him eight times, letting him fall on his knees. I shot him cleanly before he had begun to pray. I knew it was beautiful. I knew it was war. He knew it would happen. He knew in little ways we were both set free. I can remember reading a poem to him, there, just him, the gun, and me. It means here, because I'm covered without mythology. Acknowledge differences between the gun. Mimes on tunes unannounced. I send gifts, you put them in my pocket tangled with the fortunes I've got from communiques to make you aware of me, flying here across the wings of a speeding albatross. And this blue earth shrinking, exploding into withdrawal will not call them illusion, moves its body wet from sanctification. And you showed me through the window. I split the drum in pieces ticking ancient clock bellowing. My twin recollection of a woman who gave her body to light, blown out quickly by tears of her anonymity, believing she could never change, needed to change. I looked at it unashamedly in cold weather, fills my lungs. The ice of the firmament, discarded by fact, dresses itself comfortably so it can walk inside the house where soldiers will burn against the blood that spits from the cross in the days when tears moved with gravity's solemnity. I can't stop the ceremony. I 
I laid him against a fireplace. I knew. He knew me. And there was no sense of loss, only of gain. From then, the act of assassination became no longer a mystery to me. If it was a coarse act of murder, then it had to become known, to see. It wasn't as if it became like opening a book or closing a door. Each assassination hits me like the most beautiful sense of beauty known to me. Andreas used to treat it a bit like a Hemingway. Not sensing or understanding of the bourgeois affection of the matador. He would play with his prey, letting them pretty well know, knowing ultimately that he had the time and they would lose the space of shelter. It was this in Andreas that made me want to pull back. Not from work, but from the failure of men. Because women, when hurt, search for clarity. But men, when hurt, run to vanity. Women climb on the back of their arrogance and turn it away from fear into the beautiful dispatchment camp of hate. We have a power. When divorced from the banality of the collective grace, which bends us, burns us, burns us down, sending us outside barriers only the vain could create. Because the stupidity of a man's violence has no kinship with hate. It's a petty kind of misery, better suited to novelists than it is to guerrilla fighters. A woman's place rather than in the home is in the heat of fire. But my lover Andreas was born to be weak. Good men try to transform that weakness, carve it into stone, carry that stone into the centre of anguish. Andreas did that as best he could, but his hands were too often gentle and only sometimes strong. But his body sometimes could show me what was wrong. The curve of the skin against a history of shame. The curve of the skin against a history of blame. When we used to sometimes hide in France, I could see that he wanted to return. Not to fighting, but to such elemental forms of misery. I would suggest to frightened Andreas, where your voice starts fires burning inside, a mouth wet from escape. Generals don't count the bodies in Chile, Cambodia, at home. And when your body has formed a clenched fist, Stroking a sound created in gutters, despair will throw its fingers in your throat until you vomit. Essence. Knowing. Struggle is a word too complacent to use to paint your presence. Banality offers weapons freely in the battle to free you, but only fixes tightly the lock, and the mind mushrooms with no balance for explanation other than to say, there are peoples whose ideas copulate with isolation and pressure is applied to them to hold on to the absolute when it has gone with the century's wind and nothing will restore it. the stray children of the new Germany. There hasn't been a new Germany since the Kaiser. This new Germany is just a heap of shit, left by groups of SA boys, a heap of shit left to keep the stench of their diseased morality alive. This new Germany, the richest and weakest Reich, just a bunch of SA boys who were so keen on marching they'd like the rest of us to follow. They would, without us, march us towards their graves. They know, these boys, that a good German cultivated bad eyesight like a virtue. To not cease to know could have been an old German saying. In the future, if there is one, these good people will say there never was a Stanheim prison. When we shout, everyone hears, do not forget that. We, your stray children, will slit your throat so gladly as the Mau Mau did to Whitey in Africa. When Holger Mein stopped eating and moved towards and into his death, he was in actuality suggesting that you will be eaten. 
You will have to live with that appetite. We have taught you to live with the smell of cooked bomb and the abrupt disappearances of elder statesmen. And our, our violence, our violence, our violence has never been gratuitous. Nor has it been an opening we once thought it would be. But that was just a leftover of an errant optimism of being brought up amongst a syphilitic left. No desire to change, to let them know is enough. We have rid ourselves of the pile of shit they call history, thrown it to the art galleries where it properly can be seen for what it is, an object to art, already bought, already sold. I no longer can understand their needs. Mine have told another story, one so simple yet so difficult for you to understand. Let me tell you how I see this new Germany. Old prophets walk where suicides sell their lives for a few marks and there will be buyers. I am not amongst them, chewing a flame that burst from one's lips. And they cordon off the buildings. I watch another figure fall. Sculptures planted to stone. The rich are waiting to eat the night, allow for indigestion. Their eyes are nerving Andreas, who sits patiently, trying to imagine colours, wash away experience. He paints another coffee. Without milk, where are the dancers? While trains shunt each other like volley shots, while the cops make sure a man is a man, a woman a woman, themselves themselves. There are no oracles left. Their time is spent remembering what is left of the future. A peasant goes home, does not recognise the new Germany as part of his universe. Ah, tractor moves attracting suns to scratch the edge of Germany by day. Here where everyone's a foreigner, there are no reunions, only banquets of flesh washed down by hallucinogen. Call them habit. Goethe did. And there are simpler names for the new Germany. You are haunted by the ghost of your occupiers. A flag is hoisted. I collapsed, revived by imagery, stolen by escapism city. Where there is fusion, Hegel is left swallowing himself, trades his work for bananas and free entry to gallery heroes have vanished. Paint this phenomenology without and light my cigarette and I will lend you history. It costs nothing, is not remembered and even the moment is not our own. I was once drunk on knowledge and now I simply, I want to be sober on innocence. Hegel yields himself, buys wine and cheese, forgets about bread. To stop the hungry from being hungry is impossible. The new Germany is proud of her teeth, sharp as knives, waiting to impale destiny, washing her feet, watching crumbling bricks fall. I eat shit, it is the ultimate purity. Has a name, but is not locked into your abyss, unmentionable word or music. Here, where steel air disappears, where night takes it's wind behind your curtain, where slave traders meet to discuss exchanges, namely commodity units, namely humans, only seen in the saxophone whale. And you will not remind yourself until self discovers how your litany is a cancer. I'm always left holding hollow days wrapped in the arms of a mother waiting at the train station for some money to buy wine for her children's future, captured in the thousand yesterdays. And she will, and I will not, pay for our sadness, and what I now measure as your last moments is only worthy if it walks through your sound and breaks through, to let To let Gundred and Ingrid's violent lips separate your minds from its place, 
in a world there is very little left for you to listen to. But we are very good talkers, and we know you will soon listen. Look, we don't want your sanctification, nor a blessing that you would never understand. We want your good German ears for a second. The delay will cause you, will disturb you only as much as you have disturbed yourselves. Call that addressing yourself to the present. Let me dress down your anonymity. I will make confessions to reduce science of your idle malady, where possibility will arbitrate between possession and broken gifts, to deny your hope for rituals to redeem you. I will engrave love, give precision to the actions I take and the woman I have become. Look, I don't want or need to become your icon. That is just another form of slavery, another cousin to habit. And for me now, any of your tired explaining would bore me. And I have a right to my special kind of silence the silence brought by the unique power of the assassin's gun. Because in that state of clarity, there are no secrets. Nothing is for keeps. Here, where cities burst in shallow light, where gods sell themselves on street corners, assassins enchant areas of your breath, create centers where we hit. Olga used to say this place was chained by theory, but the theory itself was no longer a weapon to open anything anymore, that it had become a burden. Theory once had a part of enlightenment, but that it now had obscured our sight, and that, in fact, that had become its intention. Olga starved himself rather than face the guise of stupidity dressed as analysis. He died strong in a casket we built. His sleep had honor. I want to remind you, Holger said, there's no turning back, no theory. Just never turn back, come forwards. That could have been our incantation if we needed incantation, but we gave that up long ago. I wrote a letter to my husband it began, you swine. People like you have ridden on the backs of the mad ones, of those who had love, those who not only wished for change, took an active role in bringing about change. We dance with movement. Shitbags like you, I said, have lived on our dance. You would quietly like to call it your own, yet disown it publicly. In your afternoon sadness, claim the proximity of danger as an absolute you never knew. You are just the bitch son of Springer. People like Springer and you know that. Your words are the same. They're just different translations of the same mind at work. You have sabotaged the real work. You have acted as the rich man's liberal mind and the boss's executioner. In the Red Army fraction, we have started a story without really knowing the end. But you are just a part of a story that keeps on repeating itself. With each repetition, it becomes more obscene, more blasphemous. It's a tale told too many times to be taken seriously. Yet you pump it out pompously like a bad detective in need of, it, of, 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 of evidence. When those of us decided to bring the war home, you reacted like it was a childish act of rebellion rather than it being what it was. It was the first step we were taking to replace their brutality with our terror. But people like you have learned to live with their brutality, have even learned to enjoy it like a good child, indeed to ask for it. You, because of your obedience, have become the most frightening of our enemies. But you will be cut down, cut down easily, because you live your lives with such dumb predictability. I told him his words had lost meaning, no longer had any right to strength. It's not strength you build, but rather a duty, a willingness to believe rituals that have no sense of history. Why do people like you, I said, need to bury yourself in fable? When our fathers burned the books, why did they leave us just the lies? 
Why do you feel such a responsibility to lies? Is that what they have done, I said, to stay alive? You have perfected the art of deceit, of the old lie. You are the true children of the new Germany. And this letter he reads to his sociologist wife, adoringly, at their farmhouse table. Then he gives it to the police. I can imagine how he read it, like a poem. That's the way these bastards talk, take in the dream language, then say, pass the mirror, let us have a snort. Now, that's better. Let's ring the police. She's a danger to herself. The dutiful wife agrees, but can I photostat it for my book, she says, for the Italian publisher? These women who replace their drug taking with procreating. They couldn't reconstruct the bourgeois family. Instead, they procreated it. Called this one Tristan, this one Isol. Well, I have one hope, that our little Isol learns to use the blade, cut the throats of those who would tyrannize her with their own betrayal, ask her to start the story again. Anyway, all the letter gave to the police was a certainty of my position, politically. These clowns that think because they capture one, two, five, that their problems are over. These clowns that set out to train the most brutal expert counterinsurgent troops, they have never stopped us. We are everywhere. And our friends in the Brigade Rosse amongst the Palestinians, the Spanish, the collectives in France, all over the Americas, even inside the monster itself, there are still those who have not turned back. All over Europe we emerge and by our action pluck out those who oppress. A publisher of lies, a jurist, a boss, the armies they send to beat us, the jurist who makes their lies order, yes, they have put some of us in their jails, they murder us and declare that we ourselves will have to suicide. They know that it is not the end of it, but a beginning. They build special prisons to hold us, more sophisticated versions of Dachau and Mauthausen, like Stanheim, where they want to start the new final solution. With their many hadrics, their many angels of death, they want us to be the start of the new six million. But we will never go to our death praying to smaller gods than we are ourselves. They will not be able to tell us work makes you free. We know what makes us free. They feel that every moment of their stupid fucking lives. Every time they would capture us, they would proclaim the end of the Red Army Fraction as if, as if it consisted of a cocktail party of five. Those stupid shits, these gas bags who couldn't even tell themselves the truth. Yes, they had captured some of us, sentenced some of us to death in newly painted prisons, covered with our blood, the blood of guerrilla fighters who are not doomed by the sad history of the left. The left always allowed itself to fall for martyrdom because of its obstinate romanticism and clumsy polemics. We denied our rights to martyrdom. We knew as soldiers we would die. The first of us they murdered, Holger, he shat in their face. His knowledge and purity were obvious even to them. He shat in their face. He said, all right, this is death, then I welcome it. It is no stranger to me. And he slowly, deliberately moved into death and opened his arms. When we detain the enemy, all we hear is confessions and past sins. They want us to absolve them, then send them home with a warning. The enemy cannot face its death, yet it loves to be martyred. We denied our rights to martyrdom. We have demanded that they publicly kill us in front of the guilty public. That whining child without eyes. I want to tell you that sometimes I see this shit so clearly that I want to deny the pantomime, to open up the carcass 
of what's left. So many of my peers live. I want to burden them with the horror of the beautiful ones. Those of us who know more about dancing than you do of walking. You dead shits will explain everything until explanations come out of every orifice and pore of your body. I want to hold you firmly, then throw you into yourselves. But what I have learnt from all this is that you lack any real tenderness that has any sort of meaning, any compassion that does not go past pity. I want to talk to you quietly to let you hear your own tale you call a life. And then I want to take you out to give you what I know, not as a pedant, but as a woman who has not denied herself of the value of truth. But that burns me into a sadness that would hold me still, a sadness that would tear each savage particle of my body. When they openly murdered the first of us, you all looked the other way, made excuses, said their pain was strong. When they murdered the first of us, you all became the enemy more easily than you had become fighters for what was wrong. You became heaps of lying flesh, no longer capable of even adorning your presence with anything other than squalid fear. And look, you will walk away from me. You will carry your indifference like a medal, claim your arrogant lack of knowledge as virtue, abstain, you think, from the criminality of your reason, the brutality of your logic. When you do that, you know what you have become, what you will be. Amongst us, you will find the only part of you that sees any reason for being alive. If that makes me hard, then let me live with that hardness. Gundred would tell you of the strong children of our immigrant labourers, how they knew without analysis who their enemy was and whom to fight. They didn't need your craving for a knowledge. You know, that is not worth a pinch of shit out there anywhere. These children, she told me, had already drawn the battle lines against the oppressors, would send them packing when they entered their territory. These children, my solid family, they have not and will not enter your monasteries. They despite and laugh at those who do. They expose your coldness when you have lost the right to feel anything other than the cruel silence of animals taken to slaughter. Gundred fought and worked with these children. It was a friendship of those who fight together. I was with her once when some police goons entered the house of an agitator. In seconds, in the time, the sense of time and place that those who fight know is valuable, they had cordoned off the building and forced the thugs to leave. The enemy knew its luck. We stayed with these people. We knew what world we belonged to, on what side of the war we belonged. You suggest we are the stray children of the new Germany. You show you bastards who is lost and who is found amongst you, and the first of you that steps up and is not a warrior, then let him know he will be cut down. What is somewhat worse, perhaps even funny, about the kinds of ironies you live, you will most probably cut yourselves down. We who fight will never remember you. You will not be worth remembering. I once used to paint until I became aware of what kind of disease retreat can be, and it is only when art can be used as a weapon to change this shit that is of any use at all. When it is the cold house of retreat, then it has no rights to demand to be taken seriously, to be used by those who love. I once used to paint the world I knew I would never see. I used to paint people as they never were, in the hope they would become stronger. I left all these paintings back at the home of my husband. He'll want to show them. It will give him the kind of tears he knows have left him. 
I have told you. Yes, I have told you. When our fathers burned the books, they left us with the lies. You will use them as ornaments to fill your living quarters, to eliminate any reminder of the blinding light you know we'll all see. <coughs> Art was not a mirror to look at life, but a hammer with which to change it. So said a poet who actually knew the meaning of work. I knew I could never go back to painting, to journalism, the scum that held the old life together. I could have been blind. They murdered my lover, Andreas. He was such a clumsy boy in search of the center. He knew he could only achieve through the elimination of the enemy. They walked into his cell at Stanheim, said, good morning, Andreas. Let me shove these plastic spoons down your throat. See, at Stanheim, they didn't want us to kill ourselves. They wanted to murder us with their own hands. A large man grabbed Andreas while another tied a rope. They threw him on the floor. Anything you want, boy. The end of the world happens at night. They picked him up, threw him around. They were doing this with great force. It was the force of men impotent to understand a real soldier. All the while, Andreas swore at them. He swore at these fuckers. He knew his life would be avenged, that these bastards would be picked from the swine. They would meet their end as violently complete as this. They knew he was not exaggerating. They knew that by killing him, they had made it clear. We did threaten them in their world. They would not shrink from us, nor would we shrink from them. I could hear Andreas laughing. He was not taunting them, merely showing them that he was not threatened. He knew where he would end. He did not want exile on the Engelstrasse, nor did he want to be caged inside a prison. He at last knew that he threatened them, that although he had not completed what he had set out to do, he had done enough. He laughed with the freedom of a victor who knew his death would give birth to the moment. These SA boys, these prettily dressed fascists were killing him in their impotence. Without really knowing, one of them pulled a knife, placed it firmly in his chest and kept on stabbing until even the last gasp could be heard outside his cell. That gave us freedom. That gave these bastards no explanation for what they were doing. It frightened them. Andreas knew he had replaced the fear they were projecting on him, had been replaced by their fear of him. Not as a man, but as a sign of what was happening to them, to their world. He gave us freedom and them jail. After they killed him, they hung him from a hook in the ceiling, saying soon that our Andreas had suicided. They couldn't even keep their murder of him quiet. His shouts were like rifle fire to many ears, and if you did not hear them, then I would watch out. Because with failed sight and failed hearing, you will not hear your house being surrounded. You will not hear your door collapsing. You will not see the beautiful face with gun in hand staring at you. And if this is not clear to you, then do not ask for pity, because you have no grace. Because you were the little man handing the other a rope. It was your hands that felt the thin line of Andreas's body, your eyes staring through the glass door, your breath panting as he slid the knife in. Do not ask for clemency, because you will have lost the power to have the clarity of death. After they did what they did to Andreas, we fought back, sent people like Schleyer to meet himself on a lonely road in Switzerland. We took his life summarily as they had taken ours, and our brothers and sisters in the rest of Europe emerged into action. We fought back. By his death, our forces multiplied, like any organization faced with extinction. Our many new friends picked up the gun. They knew then that this voyage was and is never romantic. 
They replied, saying to our enemies, endure our hell. Endure our hell. Remember it was they who first stained the earth with our blood. Our terror was a reply. When they built Stanheim, it was in full awareness of the war that was being waged. It was a monument to the world they were creating. Let those who call our courage madness, let them ask themselves for what reasons were buildings like this made? Why did they set up the biggest counterinsurgent force in Europe? Why did they institute laws early in the 60s to block individual freedom? Let them ask themselves questions they are afraid to ask. Even dumbest of you know the answer. As we emerged and acted, the chance of being caught became more likely. The chance of the murderer's hands being wrapped around our throat became more likely. We stepped up the war. They replied more in dumb rage than expert tactics. They swung their truncheons around and hit anybody in the hope of hitting us. The good German began feeling the whip crack in the back of the neck. For a moment, they became the Red Army fraction. Some of us were picked up. The laws of chance must have an effect even for them. But again, they thought they had an organisation when they only had a few of its fighters. You may stop a revolutionary, but you do not stop a revolution. They were a valuable loss, but one in which we were fully prepared and fully empowered to handle. So we fought outside and inside their jails, as we had done before with our minds. And this these bastards did not expect. They expected the weaknesses of intellectuals, the inability of those for whom struggle is a dirty word. We entered their prison separated, yet still a single body and mind. They would not let us see each other, yet we had contact, every single contact, every single moment of the day. They would watch us all day through their cameras. Like Dr. Mengele, they became the angel of death, watching over us as if an experiment. They treated us like specimens. They knew that the better part of my fucking life was spent stealing myself for what I knew was coming. And they believed that here in the fortress they can make me any less a person. They want to make me a freak. I will tell you, as I told them, this fucking pit where you have sent me is like the cave, Milleropa. Learn to start observing. It is here in this pit, you fuckers, that you, not I, will meet death. Your whole fucking stinking corpse has lied longer than it ought to. I claim victory. You cannot take that away from me. I have doomed you. You have set me free. And it was there I learned how to talk again about you while every day you would come into my cell, tell me today will kill you. Tonight will kill you. They expected me to be like a frightened child of the rich. Instead, they found a warrior built in me. They would tell me they were going to fuck me, to defile me, to make an example of me. They would tell me what they had done to others. But it was a crippled animal talking to me. I would ask them how they found their days. And how empty did they find their nights? Did they get lonely? Were they always all right? They'd beat me, leave me the foulest food. They wanted me to behave like a good German girl. Christ, once they used to keep you in the dark, now it's all light, all night. They must think we have senses built like them. In my heart, I would say, watch them fall. Watch them fall. I will tell them Rome wasn't built in a day. Neither was the plague. When they caught me, they came with an army, with truncheons and tanks, these dwarf traitors who rule from the roll of dollars. Five tanks 
and other assembled units, hundreds of cops and dogs and guns waiting for me to give up. I came out with the fist of rage clenched to surrender. To surrender is not to submit, you idiots. I thought these little men would kill me there and then. I was ready for it. Like Andreas in one robbery said, gentlemen, I'm now taking over. So they brought me here. What started out as cruelty has given me peace. I have not changed. They have made me stronger. So I come into my cell each day and every night because I will be here to fight you, to show you out. You clowns who will not understand what is happening to you. You go home to your good German wife. You'll tell her, Meinhof was strange. She keeps hitting back. She hit me in the mouth. You'll tell her what Germany would be like if Hitler, it would be like, it would be like if Hitler let the Jews dirty the basis of a clean German society. She'll say, that's a good boy. It's you that keeps us alive by fighting such vermin. The Meinhof and her group would break us down. No, it's better that you kill them so that we can stay alive. But this frightened German will have to wait for her children. She'll see them coming with the red star on their chests, changing what their parents have done. They'll turn the German family inside out. So he comes back into the cell. He behaves as if we were those children, just waiting to strike him, to bring him down. He wants to understand us, so he brings in psychoanalysts and priests. They would try to speak, but they spoke in a different tongue. They spoke in another language. It may as well have been the language they used in the Middle Ages. Yet, these fakers would talk to the press. Oh yeah, they knew us. How incredibly tragic. The children of Hitler. All sorts of bullshit. They would question in pious tones, how could this happen? In the perfect German society, we have security, hope, piety. But they knew we would kill them in their beds. So this then was the reason for why they came in. One night, everyone in the block could hear them coming. They went into the cells. One by one, they opened the doors. Their open brutality had clearly begun. They took each one of us, stripped us down, started beating us, smashing us around. They hit us with hammers, with the butt of revolvers until the blood filled the floors, like an abstract painting, only more, only more. They knifed us until they couldn't push the blade any further. We screamed. It was only the shout of one who's won, of someone who's been freed. The movements we made were only the first in our dance. The more they plunged, tortured us, it was they who were getting hurt, they who were getting killed, not us. Che once said, the last cry should ring like a revolver shot, Well, we were like a volley of fire and we wouldn't let them out. They had tortured and murdered us, but they were letting us out. I went down, swung against the bed. The blood had smeared all over my perfect flesh. Their brutality hadn't stained me. I was in a white wedding dress, covered in blood, and it was they who held the ticket. They couldn't get any more. It was they who were stained.